for more, we can bring in Guillaume Lasconjarias. I hope I didn't kill your name. Uh, professor at the Sorbonne, as well as a military uh, historian. Good to have you here on the program. What is Vladimir Putin's end goal? Well, thanks for having me. It's it's really difficult to know exactly what uh, Putin's aim, uh, war aims are. Well, uh, Lavrov just said uh, at uh, on the channel that he was actually again selling the same uh, message uh, about uh, NATO's enlargement, uh, the fact that he was uh, willing not to permit or to authorize Ukraine to enter NATO, not to become a NATO member state. So it goes beyond just uh, the Russia versus Ukraine um, conflict. It's a way something as a leverage to, um, to tell the, the West in general, and the U.S., that um, all the things that started uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union is gone, so that uh, he has all the cards uh, in play, and he wants actually to um, brush aside all this history and again um, reshuffle uh, the geopolitics in Europe. Speaking of, of uh, Europe, the geopolitics in Europe, we have the French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian, who's going to uh, to Moldova today uh, to reaffirm France's support for that uh, country, which is not an EU member state. Does Vladimir Putin, in his quest to get Ukraine, potentially want to look further afield to Moldova? Well, it's it's maybe something like a common say, but nobody knows what Putin really wants, and nobody's and nobody is in in Putin's head. Mm. Nevertheless, there is uh, one uh, one thing interesting in Moldova is that it's a frozen conflict since uh, the 1990s, and you have these um, taken, um, well, old by still uh, Russian uh, military uh, land part of Moldova, which is Transnistria, and nobody talks about it. Where you still have between five and maybe seven thousand Russian soldiers, so it's literally uh, a torn in Moldova's side, and it's also a torn in uh, Europe's side because it's really close to uh, Europe, to Romania, etc., etc. So, the thing is, reassuring uh, Moldova is something. But um, we have actually to look uh, broader than just the question of Moldova. It's all about Georgia. It's all about the Baltic states. It's all about those countries that were part of the former Soviet Union that now literally are, 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 are threatened by, these, uh, by what's happening now. I want to ask you about this military convoy that's inching towards the capital, Kiev. We have been talking about it for days now, some 65 kilometers long. A British intelligence is saying... It's not made a lot of progress in three days. What, what, what do you understand could be the logistical difficulties they're facing? Well, there are a couple of things that uh, that call uh, our attention uh, on on these stalled uh, convoy. First, uh, it means a lot about um, the logistics uh, and the importance of logistics uh, in war, in modern wars, uh, and the poor state of logistics in the Russian military. Maybe uh, the second thing is. Just to have this long convoy means also that air superiority uh, is uh, at least uh, maintained uh, by the Russian, and they have enough uh, things uh, in place to prevent any attacks by Ukrainian drones or, or whatsoever. The, the, the last thing is that um, maybe they're just actually trying to reorganize and resupply these forces to uh, close uh, the and to put in place the future uh, siege and the capabilities. What is also interesting to maybe mention is the nature uh, of this convoy. You see like everything like support, um, uh, support uh, assets, um, sapper squads, artillery, everything that might uh, help uh, the Russian troops to put in place uh, this future siege. Very briefly, could the fact, we, we, we've gotten a lot of uh, reports, intelligence reports on uh, Russian defections. Could the fact that now Russian troops are on the ground in Ukraine and Russia and Ukraine, we always talk about, we've been talking about these people to people links. The fact that they're now in the country looking at Ukrainians face to face could could now that they realize what their mission is, could that play on their minds at all? It's really difficult. Because you're to, a military historian, I'm asking yeah, you well, that. Yeah, well, it's always difficult to 
to to talk about uh, the morale uh, and and how this morale is um, maybe shifting, maybe also uh, preventing them uh, of of doing their their job as a military. What I do observe is um, you have. Uh, been uh, talking about these military uh, reports. Uh, what amazes me is the poor state of communication of um, the conscripts that have been brought there and that have maybe uh, a low training or uh, just a basic training. And of course, uh, we are not told that uh, they were facing uh, something as a fierce resistance. So uh, it might go actually twofold. It might be becoming more brutal as they face resistance. It might also uh, provoke uh, these, um, these, these people leaving uh, their position and, and uh, going to the, to the Ukrainian soldier. But again, uh, it might also uh, fold into another thing that um, these uh, soldiers might also be uh, then punished by their own, uh, by their own military. So um, how strong is the esprit de corps? That's something that nobody actually knows. We'll see uh, how this pans out. Uh, Guillaume Lascon-Jarias, thank you very much for joining us on the programme.